On today's show, the Atlanta Hawks are alive in the series, coming back from 14 points down with nine minutes remaining against the Miami Heat at home in game three in a virtual must win for Atlanta. They had to dig out of the hole once again in this spot after giving up a 21-0 run in the second half of this game. They managed to do all of that, overcome it, and were led by the bench. Anika Kongwu, Mike Madonovich, DeLon Wright, a couple of heroes in this game. Touch on all of that and much more coming up on the podcast. You are locked on Hawks. Your daily Atlanta Hawks podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team, every day. Hello, friends. Welcome to episode 1226 of the Locked On Hawks podcast. I am your host, Brad Roland, coming to you deep into the night on a Friday evening. And thank you for joining us, as always, on the podcast. If you are a new listener or just wanted to stop by and check out the uh, post-game reaction of the Atlanta Hawks picking up a nice victory in Game 3, please subscribe to this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or YouTube, or anywhere that you like to get your podcasts on the audio side. And, of course, today's show will be breaking down what became a come-from-behind victory for the Hawks to basically stay alive in the series against the Miami Heat, 111 to 110. Last minute heroics. The Hawks were down by 14 points with nine minutes remaining, had to come all the way back, and they did it overcoming their own mishaps in the second half. The Heat had a 21 0 run. The Hawks did not score for almost six minutes in the second half at one point, but the Hawks behind their bench really more than anything else. And then Trey Young slamming the door at the end of this contest. A memorable win for the Hawks. They are now 21 and 3. In our last 24 games at State Farm Arena, there's definitely some positive vibes going on in that building. Of course, we'll talk about the bizarre delay to this game at the outset. But uh, as far as on the court was concerned, a gutty win for this Hawks team, as uh, I think the reality would have been if they had lost this game, it would have been, let's just say, tough sledding moving forward. Still a lot of work to do here for the Hawks to make this game, to make this series, I should say, even at 2-2 as they play on game in game four on Sunday. But the uh, first step is out of the way here with the Hawks getting on the board in the series and avoiding a 3-0 deficit. So we'll touch on all that stuff on this podcast as well as, as we always do on this show, sort of the game flow, my own observations, some analysis of what transpired, what's to come perhaps, and some also some individual breakdowns later on in the podcast. I referenced it before, but uh, we have to start here. Uh, there was a strange delay to this game. The gates were closed. I was in the building for this one, and there were uh, very few fans coming in pretty late before the game. I know that there's sort of probably a joke in there somewhere about Atlanta fans, but um, ended up being told and share this information on Twitter that it was a suspicious package outside of State Farm Arena. Later on, there was a sort of blow by blow conversations about what was going on here, but basically, the Hawks released a statement before uh, the rescheduled tip-off, that there was a package outside gate two of State Farm Arena, and three gates were closed while the APD, Atlanta Police Department, K-9 units, and security worked through the area. There was no explosive content actually found, and the package was removed safely. But basically what ended up happening was a 40-minute delay in the tip-off. Did not start this game until almost 8 p.m. Eastern, so it sort of made for a longer night than anticipated. Uh, late arriving crowd as a result. There were lots of people standing outside at tip-off that had been waiting there for a very long time. So kind of a bizarre atmosphere at the top of this game. Uh, Injury-wise, the Hawks were without Capella in this game. No, no surprise there. I know people are going to wonder if he, he can play in Game 4. I don't know anything on that. There's been nothing official whatsoever from the Hawks other than he's just out for Game 3. So we'll see if he can play in Game 4. Lou Williams also out in this game. John Collins, not in the injury report, but some updates here from Chris Kernstra at The Athletic. He talked to John this week and said he had a PRP injection in his foot to attempt to speed up that recovery on his foot injury. And also he has a torn ligament in that finger. That is uh, not looking good for him right now. He's not been able to bend it at all. Actually, Collins made a, made a three in this game, but he's not he's not himself, obviously, but some more details that had not been announced by the Hawks in that piece from The Athletic. Miami had all their guys available, although that did change late in this game. Kyle Lowry ended up leaving and missing the fourth quarter, which is definitely a huge factor down the stretch in this spot. But with all that in the mix, as I talked about a lot on the last couple podcasts that I did in between game two and game three, I thought it was a pretty decent spot for the Hawks, kind of a quick flip game in a lot of ways. They were two-point underdogs, according to Ben Online, our friends over there at tip-off, but certainly not a surprise to me that they were able to win this game by any means because the Hawks have been so good at home. I thought the Hawks had a better chance than most did coming into the night. So as for the game itself, the Hawks started out with the same starters as usual as they had in the in game two with John Collins at center. Um, this is a talking point now. We'll talk, we'll talk about, about it more later on, but um, – uh, let's just say the bench was a lot better than the starters in this game. In particular, guys like Gallinari was sort of, I, I would say, probably the prime example of a guy who really struggled and probably should have played a lot less than he did in this spot. But at the outset, 
Uh, it wasn't a disaster by any means by the Hawks, but they were they were certainly losing uh, early in this game. Butler got a little bit downhill early. Gallo did have four quick points after his massive disappointment in game two, but he kind of leveled off from there. Offensively, he was okay, but defensively, not so much along the way there. Um, I thought McMillan was very clearly trying to get the Hawks to play faster on offense and push the ball in transition because Miami's defense, when it's set, is so good, and they tried to sort of make that a point of emphasis in this game. Uh, Trey tried to give a take foul in the middle of the quarter, actually got a clear path foul, which gave Miami a free possession and some extra free throws along the way. Kind of a kind of a brutal one there, and it came off of a bad pass by Gallinari to set up that fast break. The Miami had a 7-0 run early to go up by eight points. The Hawks had some turnovers in the early going, as I talked about on the last show. Uh, ball security was a huge factor and a key for me in this game. Early, the Hawks did not have great turnover avoidance, but through the entire game, it got better, which was a huge positive in winning this game on offense. Um, honestly, they probably should have been down more than eight early in this game, but they were able to sort of, uh, uh, sort of, I guess, avoid Miami because Miami was not lighting it up on off- on offense. They missed like six or first seven threes and uh, sort of a dodged bullet at the outset for the Hawks. Rotationally, um, it was Bogdanovich, DeLon Wright, and Nkongwu. It was an eight-man group in this game. No surprise there. Um, I'll say this now, and I'll come, probably come back to it later on. Bogdanovich took almost eight minutes to come in the game in both halves. If you do the math on that, uh, obviously he's not starting for a reason. I don't really mind him not starting. I think it's worked for the Hawks to have him off the bench and have to sort of have him anchor that unit with Trey off the floor in particular. But if you don't bring him in for eight minutes, the most that he can play in the entire game, and that's if he plays the entire rest of the half in both halves, is 32, 33 minutes. That's not enough. He needs to be playing 37, 38 minutes in these, in these must-win kind of playoff games. So uh, an error there in my mind for McMillan. We'll see if he addresses that uh, in game four, but certainly uh, not enough of Bogdanovich in particular. We can talk about DeLon Wright not playing enough to, uh, as well and the Kongwu, but especially Bogey as the established sort of number two perimeter option for the Hawks. Got to play more a little bit in this series, I think. The Hawks had, an, had a nice run, though, late in the first quarter. Got in the bonus, which definitely helped them. A Kongwu had an awesome block on Dwayne Dedman, and Miami didn't score six times in a row, which is a positive. But the Hawks were only down by two. At the end of the first quarter, um, kind of an ugly offensive period for both teams, but uh, ended up kind of, kind of being a rock fight early on in this game. In the second quarter, though, the Hawks had their best offensive quarter of the series by a lot, uh, and it came actually started without without Trey on the floor. They actually were plus five in the four minutes or so that Trey sat in the first half of this game. Um, Kevin Herter had the first five points of the second quarter for uh, for the Hawks. He, he were missing a lot of jump shots, but Herter McDonovich always seemed to have sort of find some footing together. DeLon Wright was a huge factor. Um, early and often an offensive rebound and a putback also drew the third foul on Kyle Lowry, who ended up having foul trouble and an injury later on in this game. But DeLon was everywhere in this one. There was some foul trouble for the Hawks. Kevin Hur had three fouls early in this game, a couple of light calls, I thought, but also he fouled a couple of jump shooters, which you just cannot do. That's been, it's been a problem for him at times, but uh, they did have Trey Ray to come back in. So it didn't really throw, throw off the rotation too much at that point. Miami got it within one, actually. But then the Hawks had a 10-0 run, their biggest single push of the game until the fourth quarter, um, late in that first half. Trey made a deep pull-up, and then DeLon, another great defensive play. Bogey hit a three, and sort of the avalanche came there for the Hawks. They hit three threes in about 80 seconds after only making one in the entire first half before that. Trey actually tried one that was a little bit, uh, probably a little bit aggressive, let's say. He had a couple pretty bad shots in this game. But uh, after a... The timeout from McMillan. They closed the half with the long right for the most part. He came up for about one minute, but he would have played a lot of minutes in a row if not. Um, there was a big shot by John Collins late in the first half, which I mentioned earlier. A nice three from him to go up by 10 points. They were up, they were up by seven, though, at the half and in great shape. Kind of a bizarre last possession, though. Jimmy Butler kind of ran Trey Young over, and there was just no call at all. And then Bogdanovich kind of blocked Butler from behind and it looked like he might have been in some pain after that. I thought just for a brief moment in the second half, that Bogey might be hurt because he didn't come in for so long, but it just ended up being a rotation, unfortunately, for the Hawks. But 39 points in the second quarter for Atlanta. They shot very, very well from three, from the line, from the floor. Everything was positive in that spot, and that led to a 122 offensive rating before halftime. They shot 64% inside the arc and 15 assists, six turnovers. You can, you can definitely enjoy that kind of ratio. Bogey had six assists in the first half in 15 minutes. That's pretty impressive. Uh, they, def- they definitely used Trey off the ball a little bit more in that period. Defensively, it was not exactly stellar, but Miami missed a bunch of threes. That was helpful. They definitely attacked Trey in this one. I thought he took a step back defensively in this game. It was not alone. Gallinari in particular was kind of a glaring weak spot for the Hawks defensively, but they forced eight turnovers in the first half. And Miami got some big contributions from Butler and Hero before halftime, but that was kind of it uh, for Miami. There was sort of subpar, substandard elsewhere, which definitely opened the door for the Hawks in this spot. So 
We'll get into the second half in a second, just as a tease ahead to that. The third quarter was a disaster. The fourth quarter was was definitively not a disaster for the Hawks. And the uh, the balance was they lost the second half by six points, but that was enough because you're only, when you're up by seven, you can afford to lose the half by six. And we'll come back to all the details of what transpired in a moment. But first, a word from our sponsors on the podcast. <laughs> Free trials often renew without your consent. If you didn't know that, it's actually a business scam that's actually out to get you. If you think about it that way and do not let corporations pocket your money out of their own greed. Instead, what you want to do is download Truebill, take control of your subscriptions. Truebill is a new app that helps you identify and stop paying for those subscriptions that you don't want, don't need, or even forgot about entirely. And on average, people save up to 720 hours a year using Truebill. Truebill makes things incredibly simple when it comes to canceling subscriptions, and that's very important because companies making it hard for you on purpose to cancel those subscriptions. Just link your accounts and Truebill will cancel those unwanted subscriptions in just one tap. And as someone manages a ton of things online, keep up with all the stuff in the sports world, I can say that Truebill is fantastic. It makes my life very much easier, and I actually recommend it at the highest level. Truebill has 2 million users, and Truebill has helped people save more than $100 million already in its existence. Do not fall for subscription scams. Start canceling today at Truebill.com slash LockedOnNBA. Go right now to Truebill.com slash LockedOnNBA. It could save you thousands, yes, thousands each and every year. Truebill.com slash LockedOnNBA. Today's podcast is also brought to you by Shady Rays, and Shady Rays is an independent sunglasses company that gives you the features of $200 sunglasses for a fraction of the price. That can mean polarized lenses or well-constructed frames that are also durable and premium high-end finishes along the way. On top of that, Shady Rays protection program is something you just cannot find anywhere else. Shady Rays includes lost and broken protection on every single pair, and they will send you a brand new pair if you lose them, no matter what happened to actually when you lost them. Give them a try today. If you don't love it, you want to pay anything at all. It's as simple as that. Plus, every time you buy a Shady Rays, Rays pair of sunglasses, 10 meals are donated to fight hunger in America when you shop with Shady Rays. Exclusively for our listeners as well, go ahead to ShadyRays.com, use the promo code Locked On. If you do that, 50% off two or more pairs of polarized sunglasses. That's promo code Locked On for their best deal of the season. That's 50% off two or more pairs of Shady Rays sunglasses, but backed by 150,000 verified five-star reviews. Check it all out today at ShadyRays.com. <laughs> All right, the third quarter, as I mentioned before, was kind of a disaster for the Hawks. There was a inc- pretty incredible whip pass that I think got under, under uh, covered, under noticed by Kevin Herter to a corner shooter in DeAndre Hunter. Uh, it was missed by Hunter, which is probably the reason why it wasn't noticed, but it was kind of the pa- kind of the same pass that Trey Young often throws, and uh, Herter kind of a flash play there, a one hand, just like a pinpoint accuracy kind of impressive pass that was uh, noteworthy at the top of the third quarter, but kind of a choppy start overall in that third. A lot of a lot of whistles on both sides. Collins got a third foul, so did Trey, and Hunter and Herter. So all, so let's just say uh, four of the starters for the Hawks in this game had three fouls early in the third quarter. They had 14 fouls in like the first two and a half minutes, which definitely put Miami in a good position to get to the line a lot in the second and the second half and really in the third quarter. Um, there was a little bit of a pushback from the Hawks, but uh, then it kind of spun in Miami's direction in a big way. Miami tied it before Bogey even came back in. And again, I mentioned this before, but I could not believe when the Hawks called timeout they did, They still have a damage on the bench after the timeout. I don't know what the plan is. I don't know why that would be, and I don't want to rant too much about it, but Bogey not playing more in the second half was uh, maddening, let's just say. And I gave you the numbers before, but basically capped him minutes-wise in this game. He basically played as much as he possibly could have at 32 minutes, and that's just not enough for the way he's been playing in this series. But obviously the big swing against the Hawks in the second half was a 21 to nothing run by Miami. Uh, If you are an NBA person, more than just a Hawks person, Thursday night also featured a couple of crazy runs, including a, a, an exactly the same 21 0 run in the, in the Wolves Grizzlies game. Uh, That end result actually being Memphis came back and won in this game. Miami did not hold on a win for the, in the spot, of course, which is fortunate for the Hawks, but Atlanta went from up five to down 16 in the third. They did not score for six full minutes. They were 0 7 from the floor. They had four turnovers. They had some pretty Good looks, I thought, early in the run. And then a lob that Collins just almost certainly makes if he's healthy, but he's just not quite there right now. But then they kind of lost the plot later on in the run when there was some frustration setting in. Trey took a really bad shot, a couple bad turnovers that were live ball in nature. Finally, they scored uh, after all of that. 183 just kind of stopped the bleeding a little bit at a good time. But there was a discussion about Nate McMillan not calling timeout. I think he probably should have called one at some point along the way. It's not always going to fix everything, but it looks it looks kind of bad when you don't call that. Um, I think it was certainly weird to not stop the spiral. We try to stop the spiral along the way. It did happen similarly in that Wolves game last night where there was no timeout from Chris Finch. Chris Finch and it became a national story. Uh, because the Hawks won this game, it, it may not be the same thing, but uh, certainly uh, a, kind of a mess that the Hawks created for themselves at the uh, end of the third quarter. 
The Hawks did have some good possessions defensively at the end of that run. Once the bench kind of was uh, more established, Okongwu was awesome at the end of the third quarter. And then DeLon changed some possessions defensively as he's been doing all season long. And crucially in my mind, they got it back to eight. So the Hawks were down by as many as 16 in the third quarter, and it was eight again at the end of the, at the, end of the third quarter. That was the first of uh, many steps in this in this game, be able to, to not lose touch. I did say at the end of the third on Twitter, like, look, this game is not great right now for the Hawks, but it was not over. I made sure to point that out, and it felt like the Hawks were alive the whole time. Had it gotten to 20, had it gotten to – if they were down by 14 at the end of the third quarter, might have felt more out of touch, but they made their first portion of that run, which ended up being huge. They lost the quarter by 15 points, which is obviously quite bad. They got absolutely killed with Gallo on the floor, and once he sat – they were much better. In general, the starters were really bad the entire game, which is uh, noteworthy for the future, let's just say. But uh, in between quarters, this is a, a big one, I think. The Heat announced that Kyle Lowry would not return to the game with a hamstring injury. Now, I've not seen anything on, on the severity of this since I, as I'm recording this on Friday night, but it was certainly helpful to have him not on the floor for the Hawks. I would have also, record, of course, point out that Capella is still out for Atlanta and Collins is very limited. So I'm not saying this is like a huge break for the Hawks, but compared to what it was early in the game, not having Lowry was certainly a part of the story in the fourth quarter. But uh, the bench unit, the bench led unit, I should say, of Wright, Herter, Bogdanovich, Hunter, and Okongwu at the start of the, of the fourth quarter was not as great. They were actually pretty good in the first half with that non-trade group. They were plus five. Second half, not as much because Miami came out of the gate flying again and hit a three to go up by 14 points with nine minutes left. And at that point in the second half, the Hawks had scored 19 points in 15 minutes. In comparison, they scored 39 points in the second quarter alone in 12 minutes. They scored less than half of that in 15 minutes, 15 minutes to start the second half. They brought Trey back in, which I think that was just kind of a no-brainer. I'm not going to give Nate credit for doing that, but it was certainly time to do that when it was sort of getting out of touch again, down by 14. But I will say it was a good move to go go small. They brought him in for Hunter and went small and Gallo never came back in the game, which was the right decision because he would did not, he did not have anything in this game. And then as soon as that happened, when Trey came back in, it was a 15 to four run to go from down 14 to down, down three in about three minutes. And that was the biggest stretch of the game for the Hawks. Any positive standpoint, obviously. Threes by Bogey and DeLon. DeLon had this flying offensive rebound put back to cap it and kind of force a timeout there. DeLon had 13 points on his first six shots. Akangwu was flying around. He was awesome. Probably his best half Maybe as a professional, I mean, obviously when you when you factor in the importance of it all, I would say it was his best half of his career. He's probably played better in a half somewhere along the way. I'm not going to go through the uh, through the entire catalog now, but in terms of impact, he was so good in the last quarter and a half of this game, which is great to see from him. And then a bogey another three later on from there. They actually had an open three in the air by Herder that would have tied it. It did not fall down, and that was the same thing that happened later on with Trey Young. But with 3.30 to go, Trey had a three-point play. It was a kind of a circus shot. And uh, that tied the game at 101-101. And basically, the Hawks erased that 14-point deficit in six minutes. That was huge. Kind of get it, got, got things reset again. Um, they, it was not easy from there, though. Miami led again after a three by Struess. A couple back-to-back -back, um, possessions. Trey hit a huge three. And I will just say this now. Trey had 10 points in the final 330 of this game. After he was not very good before that. But uh, in winning time, your superstars got to make plays, and that happened in this game for the Hawks. Atlanta led for the first time in a long time with like 140 to go. Uh, Okongwu had an extra point play off an offensive rebound that was a huge play uh, in the game. I think he might have got a little bit of well, sort of away with an offensive foul, but it was not called, so congratulations to him on that. Um, Miami did answer right away with Jimmy Butler scoring, so it was kind of haymakers back and forth, back and forth. Um, Miami got very, very upset with a blocking call that put Trey on the line with about 120 to go. Trey made both free throws. Thought we misses a three from there. Anyway, I, I, won't, I won't go play by play, but um, the Hawks went to Hunter in for Trey on defense with uh, two timeouts remaining. It was probably a good decision to get Trey off the floor on a defense on the possession. Um, but at the same time, after that, they gave up an, an open three to Tucker for the lead with like a minute to go. Um, Butler collapsed the defense, kicked it out to Butler. Uh, sorry, to Tucker, who's an awesome quarter three point shooter. I think it was probably on Bogdanovich for overhelping, having watched watch the play back a couple of times now. But no matter what, a breakdown for the Hawks to allow Tucker to shoot an open corner three for the lead in that spot. They call timeout to get Trey back in the game, as they were always going to. And then Herter has a really good look on the wing for three, but he misses it. So the Hawks are now down by two with like 30 seconds to go. Um, sorry, down by one with 30 seconds to go. And uh, yeah, from there, things went in the right direction. They had a good defensive trip on Butler. Um, I will say credit to this, credit to Hunter at times defensively. But uh, the play before that, Butler had two pretty bad shots at the end of this game. So a good job on the Hawks' side there. But kind of a late heave that he missed. Uh, and crucially, 
no timeout from the Hawks, and that was the right decision 100% of the time. I, was, I would say that even, even if they had not won this game, um, to not let Miami set up their defense was the right decision, um, especially when you're talking about the awesome defense that Miami has. But Trey goes coast to coast, hits a floater with 4.4 seconds to go in a way that he does. He's a star player, and that was a star play from Trey to uh, give the Hawks the lead and eventually the win. Again, he had 10 points in the final three and a half minutes. And then kind of a weird – looking play after a timeout from the heat they had time but butler kind of didn't know how much time there was if you watch the play back he like very strangely wastes like a second at the top of the key just kind of looking and not doing much of anything ends up taking a very bad shot i will say this kudos to hunter for getting in his airspace uh if they called a foul there hawks fans would have lost their minds and probably never left the arena but no no no, no call nor should there have been at that point in time and the hawks escape with the win so there's a lot there but basically uh, at the end of the day, we'll come back to this later on, but the bench was the biggest factor for the Hawks. The plus minus is hilariously skewed. That doesn't always tell the story, but in this game, it really does. The, the three guys off the bench, Kong Wu, Bogdanovich, and Wright, were the big story. And then Trey came in as the closer to kind of do what Trey does. And that was really the formula for the Hawks come back and the Hawks win in this spot. Uh, takeaway wise, on the offensive side of the floor, this ends up being an offense first win for the Hawks. They had a 119 offensive rating, and finally the Hawks' elite offense shows up in this game. Despite the uh, one horrific stretch in the third quarter, they were really good for the most of, for most of the game. They shot it well, 60% from the floor on twos, 38% on threes. They took more figures than Miami did. Um, they did nothing on the offensive glass in this game, basically, at all, except for the one huge putback from Kongwu late in the game. But here's a big number I talked about a lot on the mailbag show yesterday. Only 11 turnovers for the Hawks. I don't want to overstate it too much, but if the Hawks turn the ball over too much in this game, they don't win it. 11 turnovers is uh, essentially what they average. They average about 12, so that's better than their average. And I guess this Miami team that's so aggressive, that's a hugely important number, and the Hawks were able to take care of the ball, get more shots up, and uh, just kind of won the math battle as a result of that. Defensively, they weren't great in this game for most of the, most of the way. The Heat got up 45 three-point attempts. That's a, that's too many to allow, and that might have bit the Hawks, but my but Miami only made 14 of them. So that was very fortunate for the Hawks. They, they don't really affect that all that much. There was some some quality defense for sure, but uh, a little bit of a dodge bullet there for Miami three-point shooting. But the Hawks forced turnovers, and they got um, they, they did lose the glass a lot defensively in this game. But the big swing was that Miami just didn't make the shots they made in the first two games, and uh, there you go from there. Okay, before we get into the player evaluations, and there's a lot to say about a lot of guys in this game, a word from our sponsors on the podcast. Today's show is brought to you by Built Bar, and I made it a goal to eat right this year. I'm actually having a lot of success with that because of the folks at Built Bar. In some ways, it's actually a lot easier for me to eat better because I actually enjoy eating Built Bars. And they have the protein-infused puff bars that are fantastic to all the other fan favorites from Built Bar and my own personal favorites on top of that. And each and every bar has 100% real chocolate on the outside, which makes a huge difference in taste and texture. And they really all taste fantastic. On top of that great taste, Built Bar is low calorie and high protein. You can easily replace your candy bars with Built Bars this year, both in taste and to improve your overall nutrition. Built.com has all the answers for you if you're looking on the nutrition side. And you won't believe it what you see because most Built Bars have only 4 grams of sugar, 4 net carbs, and 17 grams of protein with a very low calorie count. And Built Bar also has longtime flavors like coconut almond, lemon almond cheesecake, cookies and cream, and much more. And new flavors come in all the time. So plus, honestly, I have to tell you, Every single flavor of Bilt Bar that I've ever tried has actually been good. Even if you don't love a certain sort of hue in a particular flavor, they're all good. They're all high quality. I can attest to that firsthand. And best way to check out all, everything from Bilt Bars, go to Bilt.com. Use promo code LOCK15 when you get there. If you do that, 15% off on your order with Bilt Bar. One more time, that's promo code LOCK15, 15% off at Bilt.com. <laughs> okay, and we'll end the show with the player evaluations, as always, on this program Spoiler alert, the starters, not great. Bench, awesome in this spot. And we'll start, as we always do, with the bench. And this is the positive portion of the podcast. These three guys were hugely important in the Hawks coming back and winning this game. We'll start with the Kongwu. Nine points, six rebounds, two blocks, and a steal. Only took four shots, made all four of them. Got to the line as well, made one. Uh, I thought he was awesome in the second half of this game. First half, not a huge factor. And really, through two and a half games, I would told you that Kongwu was kind of a below average player in the series. I still love a Kongwu. Um, future facing wise, but I think objectively he was not very good in the first two and a half games of this series. And the second half tonight, he was brilliant. He really was. Defensively, he's making things happen, closing off gaps, using his speed, rebounding at a better level in the second half of this game. He finished quality around the rim and uh, just was a huge factor. I think yeah, I, I would put him a little bit below uh, right in the McDonald's on, on the hero scale in this game in terms of like just being amazing. But uh, man, he was awesome in the second half. I cannot say that enough. He changed the game in a lot of ways. Um, Bogdanovich was their primary offensive threat at times in the second half, 18 points, eight rebounds, six assists, two steals and a block. 
well-rounded. Bogey is just a uh, he's just a winner. He really is. I think we looked at that um, coming in when the Hawks signed him. But Bogey dating back, obviously, was in, it was in Sacramento. But before that, his European career, he has so much experience in these kind of moments. And last year, we saw it in the playoffs when he was getting it out on one leg. And then this year, he just made so many big shots. He had three threes in the, in the fourth quarter, all just enormous shots. Uh, and yeah, 18 points plus 16. If anything, he's got, he's got to play more. I think I don't know if I'd start him, but I certainly would not be waiting until the four minute mark of the first and third quarters, put him in the game, get him on the floor more often, if anything else, if I am the Hawks. And then, uh, of course, my guy, DeLon Wright. I, uh, it's a little bit of a bit at this point, but I mean, really, I, I've been a very loud DeLon Wright enthusiast throughout the season. I think DeLon Wright makes winning plays. I say that all the time, and that was extremely evident in this game. He does DeLon Wright stuff, which basically means all the stuff that coaches love, all the stuff that if you're watching as an appreciator of basketball, little things defensively, making the right passes, rotations, finishing when you need to, rebounding in a big way as a guard, just like he was brilliant in this game. Uh, I've made fun of it a lot, but he was out of the rotation at times in March of this year, inexplicably. And uh, DeLon, again, probably should have played more. That's how, that's how good he was in this game. But anyway, 30 minutes, game high, plus 23, 13 points, five rebounds, only one assist. Actually, didn't have a steal or a block, which is kind of funny. He had so many deflections in this game, but nothing was really rewarded. But how about this for DeLon Wright? He made all six shots. He doesn't always do that. That's the one thing he doesn't always do. But uh, five rebounds, uh, just huge ones. Two off three rebounds that were big as like stick back, stick back buckets. And uh, defensively, he just changes the game. So those three guys, all plus 16 or better, they were the hugest part of the win for the Hawks. Uh, we'll see how the Hawks tweak this thing. It would not surprise me if they didn't start Gallinari, but because they won this game, I don't know if Nate will. Uh, Nate's pretty stubborn at times. I would probably not start Gallinari. I would probably start someone else, whether it be going big, uh, with trying big with Collins or Conwood, Collins and Conwood together, or just starting the long right. If you don't, if you're just like wedded to not having Bogey start, whatever you want to do, something else would be what I would do. But alas, the starters were brutal in this game, and then the bench kind of bailed them out along the way. Uh, we'll fly through this now the rest of the way here. We'll say Trey for the end, as we usually do. I thought Herter was pretty good. He just didn't have his shot making in this game. 13 points, five rebounds, four assists, and a steal, but was only one of eight on threes. If Herter just makes his three-pointers in this game, his numbers look amazing, but he was only minus five, the best other than Trey of the starters. I thought he played well, just didn't shoot well. He was four or five on twos. Got the line once as well, um, but just did, it was one, one of eight from three. Tough to overcome that, but I thought Herter, just in terms of like floor game stuff, played pretty well. Uh, Hunter was the opposite. 117 points, which actually led the Hawks for a while in this game. But it was 17 points on 14 shooting possessions, which is totally fine. But uh, this is a crazy stat line for Hunter beyond that. So obviously the points, I'm not someone who overvalues points too much. They matter. He made two He made two threes. He made five buckets in the, inside the arc. That does matter. But Hunter played 32 minutes as a guy who played a lot of power forward in this game and, and definitely some small forward, had no rebounds, no assists, no steals, no blocks, four turnovers. Uh, you know, Hunter had 17 points and there was somebody that was like confused in my mentions. And I wasn't even like, I was picking on Hunter during the game, but people were like Hawks fans. I think rightly so were kind of like baffled by Hunter in this game at times. And, uh, I, my response was basically like, there's more to life than scoring. And, you know, Hunter is not someone who was billed as a guy who was just going to score and do nothing else, but truly did nothing else in this game. Like defensively, I will say he did a good job at times on Butler. Uh, made life difficult for him in the last play of the game. That's that's important. He is their best like in terms of just like switch guy. Um, you know, big physical, being able to stand up to Butler physically. That that, that does matter. I don't I don't want to overstate that, but it also does it, it does matter. Everything else though, it is very hard to be six eight two twenty and have no rebound thirty two minutes. Like I've made fun of it this year and pointed it out, but. DeAndre Hunter basically had the same rebound rate as Trey Young for the season, and that is unacceptable. Uh, it's kind of a fluke that he had zero in this game, but it's it's regularly one, two, three, whatever it's going to be for Hunter. That's bad. And then the lack of assists, steals, blocks, etc. Four turnovers is not the end of the world. But yeah, kind of a weird game, let's just say. The point that they had to have him, he made a couple of big shots in this game and then defensively made some plays. But uh, yeah, kind of a weird night for DeAndre. Uh, Collins, I thought, gave a game effort. Six points, five rebounds, two assists. I think he is very clearly gutting it out for the good of the team, which cannot be uh, ignored. I think he's been a huge factor. If they didn't have him right now without Capella, they would probably be done in this series. As much as the Congo was really good in this game, he was not good in the first two games, and they had to have Collins. Um, he wasn't great in this one. He wasn't terrible either. His passing's been really helpful. Having a ball mover in that spot in the short roll in particular has been very useful for the Hawks offensively. He, know, he knows what he's doing, if nothing else. 
But uh, we'll see if they go to more Kongwu. Kongwu played a lot in the second half after not playing much in the first half. I don't know if that was just you know just riding the hot hand and he was good. But uh, we'll see what what Nate ends up doing. I'll be curious to see if he ever tries the two big lineup at some point with the Kongwu and Collins. It's been a group that's played together before, just not recently. But alas, well, I thought Collins was okay. Just didn't give them too too much. Gallinari, I thought was pretty brutal. Honestly, he made a few shots early, which definitely justifies some more minutes. But eleven points on eight shots is totally fine. Poor Gallo. But defensively, he really is uh, kind of untenable in this series. Three rebounds as well. Just kind of, he's just too slow in some ways. And I think there are times when Gallo is very useful and they had to have his offense early in this one because nobody else was probably making shots. But uh, he was better than he was in game two. But it was also not a coincidence to me that when he left the floor, the Hawks got their mojo back and they were at, definitely at their best. Uh, what, I, what I don't think that Hawks can realistically do is just not play Gallo. They don't have anybody else. I know people want to see Jalen Johnson or whatever, but they're not going to throw the young guys out there right now, ice cold and playoff series. That's, that's just not going to happen. So I'm going to be pragmatic and realistic. Gallo's going to play in this series, but I think uh, he probably played too much. And, uh, and that's even with not playing really at all in the fourth quarter. So uh, I don't know if I would just not start him or whatever, but the, the quick hook would be out there for the Hawks. And I think he just cannot play this much, uh, especially on defense in the series. And then Trey Young. Uh, Trey was not great through three quarters and really through like th- almost 35 minutes of the game. I'm for- sorry, 40, 40, 40 minutes of the game. But he had 10 points in the last three and a half minutes, ended up the night with 24 points, eight assists, four rebounds, did a three turnovers, which is totally fine after the 10 turnover game in game two. Still a few bad shots. I think Trey was pu- was pressing a little bit late, but to his credit, he didn't take too many of those. Like I thought in game two, he took a couple of uh, irresponsible ones. He took only one or two in this game and, went, and only took 14 shots overall. And I got to the line 12 times, made 10. That's totally fine. Obviously, it's good. And uh, he was the hero in terms of the, uh, the game winner and a couple of huge shots before that. I was getting in the line late and then the big like 30-footer that he hit that was, uh, I think I think the tie of the game was uh, a massive shot. So Trey was a superstar, as he often is. I got to say, he's not been very good by his standards. I want to stress that by his standards through three games. Uh, he was really good late in this game, but I think for the Hawks to win this series, which we're sort of ending the conversation on, on, this, uh, on this Friday night, he has to be better than he's been in three games. Now, if he's just the guy he was late in this game, then that, that'll work. But um, as I've said before, I think the Hawks' recipe for winning the series includes Trey Young being a star, like a superstar level player. And through three games, he's had flashes of that. But game one, he was terrible. Game two, he had all the weird, all the weirdness in terms of decision making. Game three, he was kind of just quiet for the most part until late. So he needs to have one of those games on the bright side. You know, Trey Young usually has one of those games every three or four games where he just is unstoppable. So he's, he, figured, he figured some stuff out in the fourth quarter. I thought he was better in the second half overall, generally. And what, at least after that, the, the long lull. So, you know, last nine minutes or so. And yeah, I think that uh, we'll leave it there. But 40 minutes for Trey is okay. Um, that's about what he should be playing. He can't really, really play too much more than that. But uh, we'll see if they pull out all the stops in game four. Obviously, kind of another, I won't say must win, but certainly uh, another close to virtual must win in game four, stay alive in the series. But um, not as much as game three was. Because if they lost this game, they'd have been in deep trouble. So to end the podcast, uh, I'll just say this, like a, really a gutty performance from the Hawks. They had different times where they could have just given up. In this, in this spot, and uh, there were lots of like one, two, three Cancun jokes flying around in the third quarter, and I don't blame people for doing that because honestly, when the Hawks were on that 21-0 run against it's hard with the Heat were on that run against the Hawks, it felt like it was going to be off the rails. I did just I've just seen so much Hawks basketball that I knew that w- because they were still within touch, there was a long way to go, and they had the opportunity to kind of close the gap here. And Miami's offense was not great late in this game. It was been the concern that I've had for Miami is that they don't really score in the half court all that well. And Butler doesn't have it. And he didn't have it late. They didn't really have a lot of answers, but um, yeah, just a gutty performance from the Hawks. It does not mean they're going to win the series now, but certainly I feel a little bit better about what I said on Thursday about how I thought the odds were a little bit too aggressive toward Miami. Um, I think that's, you know, definitely proven to be the case now. I said this on Twitter after the, uh, sorry, before the game, but I liked that there was a bet on bet online that I really liked on the Hawks where it was uh, the Hawks plus two and a half games in the series at plus 190. So basically the Hawks winning at least twice in the series uh, with some favorable odds. That's not a guaranteed winner because they just won once. But uh, I do think the Hawks uh, are closer in this series than people thought that they were coming into game three. Um, again, though, game four is really important. Like you can give it back if you lose game four. Uh, 
not that, not not that the series will be over because it would not be. I would stress that. I will say that if they lose if they lose on Sunday, I'll tell you this right now. I will come on the podcast and say the series is not over yet. But at the same time, the Hawks cannot really afford practically to lose Game Four on their home court. So it becomes another huge game. But credit to them, they won this game to make Game Four really matter because if they lost Game Three, it would have been uh, tough. Let's just say. So all that said, Game Four arrives. On uh, Sunday evening at the 7 p.m. tip-off. We'll see if it starts at 7 p.m. This game was supposed to start at 7 p.m. as well. Uh, no betting line that I've seen just yet about the series at this point in time, although I will tweet that out at some point, I'm sure. Uh, one one site that always uh, sort of has updated up-to-the-minute probabilities is 538. And 538 is kind of like the Hawks this year for the most part, but um, at the moment, 538 gives the Hawks a 20% chance to win the series. Oh, I've actually seen, as I looked at just now, it's updated itself at this moment on Friday night, the series odds are as follows for Bet Online, our friends over there. The Heat are minus 900 and the Hawks are plus 640. Uh, that's about half of what it was uh, before game three. The Heat were minus 1800 on Bet Online. So, still very large favorites are Miami at Bet Online, our, our sponsors and friends on the podcast, but a lot less so. And that's the power of a win. If the Hawks were to win game four, it'll be a lot closer than that, even. So, that's if uh, if you're interested in the Hawks, that's the price is now available. We're going to at least pass that along to you. But uh, no podcast in between game three and game four over the weekend, all that stuff. It's been a crazy week. By the way, we've done six podcast episodes in the last five days. Lots of po- lots of content up there. If you already listened, thank you for doing that. It always helps us to uh, click again through and uh, sort of help us around and try to do your best to uh, patronize the podcast. But please, please, please subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, our YouTube channel has been growing and growing. I really appreciate that. Everyone that wants to look at my uh, ugly face and some pretty, uh, I, I've gotten some uh, picked on messages for uh, my lack of quality on video. I'm trying my best. The camera that I have is uh, better than it was, and I'm still trying to uh, fix, fix up fix up my uh, setup a little bit, but I'm doing what I can on this podcast, and it's still an audio first medium, but YouTube subscribers are definitely very helpful as well. Follow me on Twitter if you'd like to, at BT Roland. Follow the show on Twitter, at Locked on Hawks. And uh, as always, we're back again after game four. And that's a big one, of course. Uh, in the meantime, in between these two games, I would certainly encourage me to encourage uh, you to follow me on Twitter to uh, get the real-time updates. I will have uh, you know stats and odds and all the observation stuff on the podcast. But yeah, thank you for listening, everybody. It's been a long day, a long night. Hopefully you enjoyed this show. And we'll see you again in about 48 hours.